you describe a conservationist as a person who protects only one particular species or as a person who, in a balanced manner, aims to protect the full spectrum of the biodiversity that nature presents. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature tells us that the main objectives of a national park are conservation of the full spectrum of biodiversity, recreation as well as research. South Africa's Kruger National Park is renowned for its incredible biodiversity across the 35 different landscapes and six ecosystems that the park encompasses. The variety and beauty is simply extraordinary, with some 2,000 plant species, over 500 bird species, hundreds of other animals, reptiles, insects and invertebrates. But will the park stay that way? Sadly, far too few people realize just how extraordinary this biodiversity really is, let alone appreciate it. An extremely important part of this biodiversity is the elephant, a keystone species, so critical to the ecology of the Kruger National Park. They are super animals, highly intelligent, extremely adaptable, maintaining very close family ties to members of their family groups. For example, see how this matriarch waits and watches over the youngsters making their way through the water before she moves on and joins them. And here one young elephant helps another to get up and out of the little hole that they were in. Research into the history of elephants in the Kruger Park suggests that elephants were never at high densities in the past. For example, in only three out of some 500 sand rock paintings found in the park is an elephant depicted a strong indicator that elephants are relative newcomers to the area, not having been there during the time of the sand people. There are many other sources of historical information which also indicate the same lack of elephants. Stevenson Hamilton, the very first warden, estimated there to be only 10 elephants in the park in 1905. It is amazing how deft an elephant is with its trunk, the tips of which can function like forefinger and thumb. An elephant will outlast any other animal in utilizing the nutritional resources of a landscape, it being a grazer, a browser. It feeds off branches, chews the bark off the thinnest of twigs, and also feeds off the roots and the bark of a tree. When an elephant feeds off the bark of a tree, the tree invariably gets ring barked, causing it to die off over the next year or two, standing bare without any foliage for a number of years. A felt fire will then reduce it to ashes, leaving no trace that it ever existed in the area. This results in a multitude of large landscapes, each presenting a high volume of dead trees, bare, just waiting to fall over. Or a landscape that is denuded of any tall trees. Drought and fire also destroy trees, but the impact of these occasional events is minuscule and irrelevant when compared to the progressively growing destruction caused by elephants. This young 20-year-old knob form, like thousands of others, has been ring-barked, 
removing it as a potential nesting site for any number of other species, while not only depriving the giraffe of its favorite browsing tree, but also precluding the giraffe from contributing to the biodiversity of the area, it being the main pollinator of the knobthorn, regarded as the indispensable tree of life. A regular visitor cannot help but notice the changing landscapes across the entire Kruger National Park. Not only dead trees standing, but also those that have fallen over. It is a gradual yet steady process, like a proverbial frog in boiling water, not immediately recognized by a tourist or casual visitor. In addition to ring barking, trees are regularly pushed over by adolescent elephant bulls, purely as a show of their strength. The greater the density of elephants in an area, the more adolescent bulls will be present, the more trees will also be pushed over. In its 12 years of life, this jackalberry tree has reached a height of 45 centimeters. If allowed to, it will grow to a height of 25 meters and live for 200 years. While not a target for elephant action, it illustrates the length of time it takes for a young tree to reach maturity. It will take 140 years or so before that jackalberry tree can replace these majestic trees that were pushed over by elephants in a matter of minutes. And during this 140 year period, some 10 generations of either martial eagle or tawny eagle will have been deprived of building a nest on such tall trees, their habitat and that of a variety of other fauna having been destroyed. In 1944, there were 13 tall, large canopy trees per hectare in an area east of the Sitara Rest Camp in Kruger. Eleven years later, in 1955, there were still 13 tall, large canopy trees per hectare. Then the elephants moved in, and now there are none. There is not a single tree in that area for a raptor to build a nest in. There are a number of areas within the park that are fenced off, from which elephants are excluded. In aggregate, no more than 1% of the total 2 million hectares of Kruger. These are visible from Google Earth, clearly showing the difference in the landscape where elephants are present compared to those from which they have been excluded. The abundance of white flowering knobthorn trees on the left, western side of the Klandratawa River, where there are no elephants, compared to the right, the eastern side, which is within Kruger, where there is not a single knobthorn tree to be seen, emphasizing the impact from elephants. Other reserves, such as Mijijani, Pilansburg, and Madikwe, present a stark example of what awaits the Kruger National Park. They clearly illustrate the extent to which the elephants have denuded vast areas, not only of trees, but other vegetation as well. If anything, they give credence to the original carrying capacity of 6,500 elephants that was set by two Kruger National Park scientists in the late 1960s, Piet van Weyck and Neil Feol. It is a standard that was generally accepted by early managers and conservationists that were involved in managing elephant numbers 
in the Kruger Park for 33 years thereafter. Yet some state that the concept of a carrying capacity is outdated. So what does all of this mean? The majestic Battelier Eagle and the Secretary Bird have now both joined the Whiteback Vulture and the iconic Marshall Eagle on the red list of critically endangered species that are threatened with extinction. They have one thing in common, their habitat of tall, large canopy trees. While the habitat of the more prominent members of the fauna families are being destroyed, so too is the habitat of the lesser seen, smaller creatures whose habitat on the ground is being trampled upon. Compacted, with nothing able to grow there wherever elephants frequent. In the northern part of the park, ancient 4,000-year-old baobab trees are being heavily impacted, adding to their stress from climate change. The destruction of the biodiversity in the Kruger National Park, transforming it from a woodland to a grassland, has far-reaching consequences, quite besides the threat of extinction of raptors mentioned. If a leopard cannot find a tall tree to hoist its prey up into, it will lose its prey to hyenas and probably starve to death, as is reportedly the case in the Madikwa Reserve. The pearl-spotted owlet. The barred owlet. Bush baby. Barn owl. The Roos Eagle Owl, Pell's Fishing Owl, Ground Hornbill, and Jennet are amongst many other species that utilize trees for their nesting sites and habitats. It follows that their numbers will be greatly impacted by the loss of their habitats brought about by the so called ecological engineering of the elephant. That iconic emblem of a safari in Africa, the giraffe, is by no means spared as it loses browsing opportunities. Why has the Kruger National Park come to this sorry state? Has South Africa's government agency that is charged with the management and care of national parks, sand parks, been ill-advised and have been following fundamental errors of concept? Firstly, that one cannot count elephants in a reserve the size of the Kruger National Park. Secondly, that there is no clear correlation between the density of elephant numbers and the ecological impacts. And thirdly, that only landscapes need to be managed instead of the number of elephants. The elephant population will then self-regulate. In business principles, there is a doctrine what you measure you can control. With the advice given to sand parks that one cannot count elephants, notwithstanding the fact that total aerial counts have been conducted each year in 33 earlier years with a 97% confidence level, has the attention to methodologies used to produce elephant population numbers changed, resulting in patent shortcomings? Have the teachings that one cannot count elephants taken root. Some scientists maintain that, as the elephant population grows, the rate of growth in their number drops. However, if one analyzes the officially reported numbers, as the table shows, the latest growth rate works out to be 14% per annum, from an established norm of 6.5% per annum. This sudden increase in the growth rate cannot be correct. 
If it was indeed correct, the resultant population in 2021 will then be six times greater than that original carrying capacity that had been set, which is a standard that is not known to have been disproven. Close examination of elephant numbers and related growth rates reveal a spectrum of possibilities since the total aerial count that was undertaken in 2007, before the doctrine of not being able to count elephants was announced. This spectrum indicates that if the generally accepted long-term growth rate of 6.5% per annum is applied to the 7,806 elephants present in 1994, the year that culling was stopped, there would now be 42,743 elephants in Kruger in the year 2021. With an adult elephant consuming around 140 kilograms of biomass per day, or 50 tons in a year, it is conceivable that such a population size will consume 1.7 million tons of biomass in the Kruger each year. Add to this the biomass that is lost through ring bark trees and trees being pushed over to provide some idea of the extent of extraction that is taking place purely due to elephant activity. Yet, as mentioned, some maintain that the concept of a carrying capacity is outdated. Given the graphic examples of what is happening in the Kruger National Park, as well as the other reserves, there can surely be no doubt that there is indeed a direct correlation between the density of elephant numbers and the number of trees and other forms of biomass being destroyed or removed. The new norms and standards for the management of elephants, published in 2008, provided for five management options to manage the size and the growth rate of elephant populations. Contraception, range manipulation, incorporating range expansion, translocation, hunting, and lastly culling. Contraception has been proven to be logistically impossible for an elephant population the size of that in the Kruger Park. Range manipulation, which in essence entailed the closure of artificial waterholes and referred to as landscape management, had absolutely no impact on elephant numbers, notwithstanding claims that such closures resulted in a drop in the growth rate. During one of the severest droughts in the Kruger in 2015 and 2016, Rangers were commissioned to report carcasses of elephants that had succumbed to the drought. Not a single carcass was found. Besides, an examination of the numbers reported over a period of time completely dispels such a claim. Elephant numbers in the Kruger National Park are not impacted by drought nor the closure of waterholes. They simply move to another part of their large on average 880 square kilometer home range to where there is water even if they have to dig for it and in the process they place even greater density stress on the environment there. The Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area expanding the range envisages the creation of corridors along which elephants are supposed to move out of the park to link up with the elephant communities in conservation areas in Zimbabwe and in Mozambique. This resonates with Richard Levine's metapopulation theory developed in 1969 from a study of coral reef fish and butterflies. It is, however, an hypothesis, an unproven, mathematically based theory when it comes to elephants. With this hypothesis, the future of the biodiversity of the entire 2 million hectares 
of the Kruger National Park have been placed on the roulette wheel. Ask yourself the question, what would encourage an elephant herd to leave its existing home range, say 200 kilometers to the south, to move along a corridor populated by humans and therefore a dangerous environment for the elephant, in order to link up with other elephants a further 100 kilometers away? Can there be any other reason other than the departing herd's home range having been completely depleted of diverse nutritional resources, as happened in Savo in Kenya in the late 1960s? Then ask yourself another question. Given that an elephant will outlast any other animal, what would have happened to all those different species that were dependent on some other habitats and nutritional resources that are now depleted by the elephant? And finally, ask yourself the question, what management action is to be employed then when the expanded area has also become saturated and is similarly being destroyed? And, as said, the entire 2 million hectares of the park's biodiversity are being put on the roulette table awaiting the theory to be proven, or disproven, this over a time frame that will span generations. Translocation possibilities have been exhausted, with every area that is within reach being saturated. Keeping an elephant cooped up beyond a 24-hour travel time to facilitate translocation is logistically impossible. Hunting within the Kruger National Park is questionable, as individual specimens would be the focus, placing the gene pool of large tuskers undoubtedly the target of a hunt in jeopardy. Let us learn from the Amboseli National Park in Kenya, where the lesser kudu and the bushbuck are now both extinct because the erstwhile woodland has been transformed into a grassland by elephant. Let us also learn from the collapse of the ecosystem in Savo in Kenya and the self-destruction of elephants there when the woodland was transformed to grassland by them in the late 1960s, as is currently taking place in Kruger. Elephants died off by their thousands, an event that was preceded by the black rhino in Savo dying of starvation. Why? because the rhino could no longer reach the browse line that had been lifted up by the elephants. Savo lost its last black rhino of a population of 2,000 as a direct result of the elephants' ecological engineering. As for the subsequent near self-destruction of the elephant themselves, the biomass had become so depleted of nutritional value that, when the severe two-year drought came about in 1970-71, the elephants succumbed to malnutrition by their thousands. People then came and helped themselves to the thousands of tusks that were lying about. At the time, Dame Daphne Sheldrick of the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Kenya lauded the management philosophies applied by South Africa's Kruger National Park, culling elephants to keep their growth rate steady, keep the elephant condition in a good state, and, in the process, ensure the protection of the biodiversity of the Kruger Park for future generations. Another casualty of the transformation of the woodland to grassland in Salvo was the Jiranuk, that long-necked antelope, a browser that is now extinct in Salvo. Cunning was terminated in 1994. While unpalatable as it is, such management action did keep the elephant numbers in check and preserve the biodiversity so that elephants could survive into the future. 
Are we going to resign ourselves to the loss of the Kruger National Park beyond redemption? Or are we going to do something about it and recognize that culling is the only option that will address the situation? And yes, it is an unpleasant option. But if we do nothing about it, then expect the sun to set permanently on the biodiversity of the Kruger National Park. Thank you.